gardeners, we thank you so much for tuning us in. This is Mid-American Gardener, and we are here to talk about plants and bugs, maybe plant diseases, trees, you name it, whatever comes up, we are going to do our best to answer your questions about things in the Mid-America part of the country. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So if any cut flower questions or perennial questions come up, I'll answer some of those. But we have three really talented folks here on the panel, and we're gonna go to them. They're gonna answer a question, introduce themselves and answer a question, and then we'll go from there. I'm gonna throw it over to you, Bill Vanderwhite. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I'm a certified arborist, so if you have any tree questions, I try to answer those. And I have a question from a viewer about a Bing cherry tree. He said, I have a Bing cherry tree, and 15 feet away, I have a Washington cherry tree. My problem is that they bloom a couple of weeks apart. The Was Washington cherry blooms first, and the blooms are brown and falling off by the time the Bing blooms open up. Therefore, I get no cherries. Any help on getting those to bloom at the same time? My mother suggested uh, grafting a branch from the Washington onto the Bing tree. Is this a solution? Well, the Bing cherry tree is a sweet cherry tree, and uh, typically, traditionally, sweet cherry trees are self-infertile. So you're going to need two different cherry trees or two cultivars to get them to produce cherries. And I've, I've checked on the Washington, and I could not find that cultivar. I've asked some other people who know a little bit about this more than I would, and uh, nobody has heard of the Washington, so I just don't know what that cultivar is. Uh, I can recommend a number of cultivars that would work well with the uh, Bing, and that would be the Van, the Lappins, the Black Tartarian, the Stella, and the Windsor. If you didn't get those, you can check on the internet, and there will be many suggestions. But if you plant one of those trees, uh, you should get uh, you should get cherries. Uh, producing on the Bing. So, and I don't think uh, grafting the Washington onto the Bing is going to be a solution. So uh, just try one of those cultivars and you should get cherries. And, and keep in mind too, if you just planted these cherry trees, it does take a number of years before they will produce. Maybe four or even up to seven sometimes. So. My guess is that if the uh, Washington uh, blooms a week and a half, two weeks ahead, it's probably a sour cherry That's because what I was thinking. Montmorency yeah. and the North Star sour cherries in my yard bloom about a week and a half ahead of the sweet cherries. Mm -hmm. So they could just search for some sour cherry cultivars and maybe plant one or two and see if it'll yeah. well, that'll work the with the Washington, the but not with the, the Bing. Washington. The not sour the cherries Bing. tend to be they're self-fertile. They, generally, they, can, yeah. they don't need it necessarily to have another cultivar, another tree. Right. But the Bing definitely. The Bing, the sweet cherries by and large do. There's some exceptions, but they'll always bloom better with another. Uh, yeah, the Stella, I think, is self Cultivar Stella and, and Lappins, I think, both. But okay. Uh, so there are yeah, some cool. ideas for you about uh, the Bing sweet cherry tree. Okay, let's then go next to you, Jim Schuster. Okay, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired plant pathologist and horticulturist with the U of I. Uh, my my email says I have I, the person lives outside of Urbana on Yankee Ridge, and is losing 30 to 35 year old blue and Norway spruces that are 10 to 12 inches in uh, DBH, in in his windbreak, and he thinks it's due to uh, sudden needle drop or what they call sneed, and he wants he's going to cut those uh, sick trees down, and he would like tips on how to save the rest of the trees. Well, first of all, sneed has not yet been proven to be a disease. Uh, it's been, well, I should say infectious disease or a pathogen uh, type uh, disease. It has been found on declining trees, but they do not yet know if it's the cause of the decline or is there because it's declining, and like maybe it's a w very weak pathogen or a saprophytic uh, type fungus. So my question, is, and by the way, in Sneed, if it is uh, causing um, dieback, uh, it should only affect the older needles because the new needles are not touched until the following year. So your tree should not be dying. Uh, in fact, none of the needle diseases tend to cause on the spruces uh, current year growth to die. So I would suspect if you're losing every needle on the branch and the trees are dying back, that it's not sneed, it's cytospora canker. And cytospora canker loves the uh, blue spruces and the Norway spruce is somewhat more resistant but not immune. 
And so I would suspect cytosper canker is the main killer and there is no chemical control that works on it. You're cutting the trees down is uh, uh, one of the controls and uh, trying to reduce stress on the trees that are still alive, like making sure they're not going through a lot of drought stress, they're not drowning in heavy rains, uh, they have good soil, um, uh, you know, basically when I say soil, they haven't planted too deep in the soil when they were planted 30 years ago, they're not being girdled by their own roots or something else. Uh, those are the only things that will help you with cytosol canker, but I don't think Sneed is the reason your trees are dying. Yeah. Okay. And I, I would really stay away from blue spruce. Oh, that's, yeah. That's just a tr mm -hmm. problem tree, really. It, it, it was it's it, from the Colorado. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. belong this far yeah. down or this low an elevation. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can say I don't have any. When I moved, I realized, wow, that's a problem. Of course, don't have scotch pines either. I don't think yeah. you can even buy them, can you? But there's still a few mm -hmm. around, so yeah. don't. I'm going to like to make one more comment. Sure. Colorado spruces are the ones opponent to cytosolic. It doesn't matter what the color is. Exactly. And they always right. say Colorado right. blue spruce, but they also that's come in pure thing. greens. So anywhere yeah. from a really nice blue to a steel blue to green, they're all Colorado spruces. Avoid them. And you say the color, and then you say Colorado spruce. We right. learned that in school. Blue, Colorado spruce, not Colorado blue spruce. Right. So, okay. We love our trees. Well, let's <laughs> go to a bug guy next. And I'm going to throw it over to Dr. Phil Nixon. I'm Phil Nixon. <coughs> I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, which means I do bugs. And if you have house plants, you've probably had them in long enough that you're starting to see little bumps on them. Uh, this is brown soft scale that's along the, uh, along the uh, uh, mid vein and so on. And scale insects are sucking pests. They will uh, suck out to sap, and a lot of that will be They'll pull the water out, and what comes out the back end of the scale is essentially a soft, uh, a sticky material, kind of a, a concentrated sap or a light syrup we call honeydew. It is sticky, and that's why these leaves are kind of shiny looking. Uh, there you are. Oh, no, I'm moving. <laughs> no, it doesn't stick. But it feels like it will. You, mm -hmm. they, you'll notice that the uh, carpet underneath or the, or the floor underneath the plants will start getting sticky. You'll start seeing the shiny stuff on them. Uh, and uh, here's a chef Lara that has the same situation, and you can see the scale considerably better here, perhaps. But at any rate, the, uh, uh, this particular insect is something that will build up if you have your plants outside in the summertime. There are predators and parasites that kind of keep them under control, but as you, the longer it stays inside, the fewer of those natural controls are, and they start building up. And so uh, be watchful for that. There's a couple ways you can control those. What is, is that you can use an nematocloprid product. And listed here are three that are uh, available for, uh, for use indoors. Most of them are outdoor type materials mm -hmm. associated with that. And so, uh, so these, are, these are some products. There are others that are available, but they will be out on the label. You can use them indoors. Essentially, these are granules you put in the soil. If you want to avoid a chemical control that way, you can remove all the scale you can find and then keep doing it on a weekly basis and spray them with insecticidal soap on a weekly basis for three to four months straight. So you can do one application of chemical insecticide or spray them 12 to 16 times and get to the same results or keep the plants alive until you move them outside where another nature will kind of take care of them. Or you can throw them away. <laughs> what, the scale? Oh, yeah. oh, they're nice bugs. Oh, the plants. <laughs> He's trying to save the nice bugs. Uh, it's amazing how those leaves glisten oh, yes. in the light. Mm -hmm. Oh, and mm -hmm. they were sticking to the table. Oh, okay. Well, but we need to know this stuff so we can get rid yeah. of them. It's always okay. fun when I get somebody that says, I got a tree outside that when it's, it's not raining except when I walk under the tree. And then when I tell them they're getting hit with bug poop, which is yeah. honeydew, they... Kind of honeydew out. does sound better. Yeah, mm -hmm. honeydew say. does sound better. Ooh. Well, we're waiting for a few more calls. We have one, but if you'll call us in, that uh, call in to give us your question, we'd love that. Well, while we're waiting for some calls, let's go to the Did You Know section next. You should not apply insecticides or fungicides with the same sprayer you use for weed killers. Vegetables like melons are very sensitive to the chemicals and even small amounts of weed killer residue can cause damage. 
Okay, well, let's go to our phone lines. We have uh, Grant online too, and he has a plum tree question. Hi, Grant. Hi. Uh, I have a question about a tree that's in my front yard. I've had it, uh, we planted it a couple of years ago, and it's a flowering plum. So the leaves are dark purple, and mm -hmm. it flowers like sort of a pinkish white. And, but every, uh, for the past couple of years, um, Right before it flowers, it starts to develop these dark spots on the leaves. And the spots develop into holes. And by the end of the flowering season, the leaves will just be riddled with holes. And uh, it, it almost looks as if it's being eaten from the inside. So I don't know if this was a fungal problem or maybe pests of some kind. I did treat it with like a general... Uh, insecticide, but it doesn't seem to have made any difference. Okay, I'm looking at these two guys yeah, over here. Jim. Take it away. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a leaf spot to me. Yeah, it's a leaf spot, it's, uh, <laughs> but it's probably not fungal because um, the more common leaf spots that cause spots to fall out of the foliage is actually bacterial, and we have very few good bactericides for your trees. So, uh, but if you want to try, try a bactericide. Uh, first, and they have to be done preventively. You, once the tree is infected already, the uh, bacteria, or even, or even a fungicide on a fungus, it won't kill the uh, spots that are already uh, um, growing. So you, all you do with the bacteria side or the fungicide is to prevent new ones. So you would want to consider trying as the leaves are coming out, because uh, generally uh, in the spring on these plants, they get infected when the leaves are very young and soft and easy uh, for the disease to penetrate, especially bacteria, which are weak pathogens. They're going to tend to come in through an insect bite, uh, some maybe a wind injury, or uh, the stomatas on the leaves and things like that. So you're going to want to um, use a preventive bactericide. Try that for one year. And if that doesn't work, then I want to suggest that you send a sample to your local extension office and have them verify what you uh, actually have. You mean the type of tree or uh, what no, the, the leaf spot? Uh, whether the leaf spot. So they yeah. could send it to the plant clinic or, yeah, or the plant clinic or the as well. uh, yeah. your local office. Yeah. Yeah, I think we do actually have a plant clinic screen. If we come across it, we can put that up. So uh, he could do it personally if he wanted right. to, as well mm -hmm. as the extension office. Okay. Thank you for that question, Grant. And we're going to go to uh, line three. And Phil has a question about blackberries. Oh, there's our plant clinic um, screen. So. Um, a, sit a regular gardener can send in right. mm -hmm. to that as well. Okay, well, let's go to Phil's question on line three about blackberries. Hi there. Hello, uh, this is Phil from Lincoln. Okay. I have been raising blackberries and blueberries for several years. In the last couple of years, I've experienced the new Drosophila or fruit fly that starts laying eggs in the unripe fruit. And so you end up picking, say, blackberries and put them in the refrigerator and two days later there's little white uh, larvae coming out of the fruit. Is there mm -hmm. something besides malathion that can control this? Uh, it gets worse, of course, as the season co goes along because the uh, unripe fruit or the ripe, ripened fruit that falls off is a source that they can uh, grow under the blackberries and if you don't get every single one, it's a problem. Yeah, what this is with is spotted wing drosophila and uh, we actually talked about this the last time I was on. And so if you can go to your PBS station website, you can probably go back and get the full schmear. Uh, <laughs> but at any rate, uh, you want to uh, dispose of, of rotting fruit, overripe fruit, damaged fruit, good sanitation is good. Blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, cherries, uh, boysenberries, well boysenberries are hard hardier. year. Uh, but, uh, but even pokeweed berries and uh, and honey, honey loc honeysuckles, things of this nature. A lot of these various berries will support these. Uh, generally for homeowners, we recommend doing that. That will pretty well take care of it. There are some insecticides you can use. Probably the, the easiest one to find, and one that's gonna be the one of the best is gonna be Spinosad, uh, which uh, will be sold as, by Bonide as, I think it's called Bug Beater. And, uh, and that can be applied as directed 
You want to make sure you follow your pre-harvest intervals. There's only so close to harvest you can apply that material. It takes two or three sprays, but generally for the home gardener, just clean up all the, the fallen fruit, all of the bad fruit, everything else. Keeps those flies down to a minimum to where you don't have too much fresh meat with your berries. Yes, I do recall you <laughs> chatting about the proteins yeah. that people could be in. Yeah involved with. Okay, well let's go to uh, Lillian's question on line four. It's about an orchid. Hi Lillian. Hi. Uh, I'd like to know what to do with it. It has put out about uh, one, two, three, four, five new leaves. Do you think it'll bloom? Um, now do you know what kind of orchid it is? Probably doesn't I bought it at uh, CVS. Huh. It's probably a moth orchid, probably. Yeah, I was thinking it probably. Phalaenopsis. Those little phalaenopsis. It usually, for me, I get flowering from February to April. So I don't know, depending, when did it, did it just flower w when you first no, got? No, I bought it last uh, Easter time. Was it flowering then? Yeah. Okay. Well, it should flower in the spring. So if you've got the new leaf growth, that will come before probably any flower initiation. I haven't seen any on mine this year, but I usually get some coming along about now. But it is usually in the spring. I don't know if any of you want to chime in, but but I think it might be a wait and see game. Do you have? Is there a temperature factor she has to worry about? Um, do you? I have it usually in a east window. Do you know what location, what facing your orchids are? Yeah, I got it in the middle of the kitchen table, and it gets sun or gets light from the patio. Um, you may want to move it closer, you know, to initiate flowers to move it closer to the light, and then once the flowers are initiated, then you could have it back on the table. But I have it in an east window or something where it's higher light for a longer period of time. So you might move it until you get some flower buds going. But temperature-wise. I just have it in the 60s, you know, I don't have it too hot, but uh, it should initiate even with 70s, because I think our greenhouses, yeah. um, they yeah. have it much warmer than my house is. Well, the reason I asked, I know somebody is raising about eight different kinds of orchids, and he has them in his house, but the temperature is kept at 68 degrees, and it, it, they just bloom and bloom and bloom, and they last forever. Yeah, so if you can get that cycle started, but it's a higher light area, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, we're going to say go for the higher light if you possibly can. Okay, thank you, Lillian, for your question. And now we have a question about Brussels sprouts, and Tom is on line five. Hi, Tom. Hi, Diane. Tom. Hey, I've got a question. I've, I've been planting Brussels sprouts for over 10 years. Uh, they were doing so good, and now all of a sudden I went from the two inch bulb. Uh, the plants are approximately three and a half to four foot tall, but now they're all back to marble size again. So, and I'm, I don't know what I'm missing in the soil, the nutrients or whatever, but the pH is right dead on it. You are, you are rotating where That's in the I garden you plant them, aren't you? Because if, because the cold crops, as Jim will tell you, are susceptible to lots of soil-borne diseases or some that are very bad. And if you don't rotate, you're going to get exactly what you're seeing. So do you, do you move it in your vegetable garden? Pardon me? Have you been moving it? Yes, oh. I, moved, I moved it five times so far. Yeah, how far apart? Uh, approximately five to six foot. Well, that should be. That should uh, be. Yeah, that should be enough, yeah. I mean, if you're only moving it one or two, then the risk could cross into the, where you, they were growing worse last year, but five to six feet should uh, not allow that to happen. Well, uh, Chuck Voigt is our Brussels sprout specialist, yeah. and he would say to plant them in July and have it in the cooler time of the year. Do you do it early and get them into the summer? No, I plant them early in the year uh, because this year the El Nino is gonna be just totally horrid uh, for we are having a very dry, hot, sticky, no rain well, summer. Well, you up. may wanna try a second crop later on right. to go into the fall yeah, to get that cooler temperature so it's not dry and hot. Yeah. Plant but, like in August and get yeah. the crop in October. Those yeah. vegetables do best when they're producing uh, what you want to eat when it's cooler. 
Right. So I think he sows the seed in July, plants it in August, and harvests yeah. it October, November. Okay. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, let's go to another email or two, and I'm going to look at you, Bill, sure. first. Sure. Sure. Be happy to. I got. Uh, this is a bit of a head scratcher. It's uh, a viewer down in Lake Sarah in Effingham, Illinois says uh, they have very huge, old huge oaks, hickory, and walnut trees. And this is the first year I can remember in over 30 years, none of these trees has produced a single nut. Can you explain this? Uh, my second question is, what will the gray squirrels do in the absence of all these nuts this winter? <laughs> so, um, well, you know, it's not uncommon for, say, like an oak tree population sometimes to have like a boom and bust in terms of uh, acorn production where they have a, a really strong year, they call that the mast year, and then the year after that it'll be kind of weaker, and sometimes the third year almost nothing at all. But I'm, I'm, and hickory and walnut can do that a little bit too, but I'm, I'm just surprised that they all shut down at the same time. Mm -hmm. It seems very uh, atypical and it's just not the pattern. Uh, the only thing I could surmise is, uh, you know, something interrupted pollination, uh, late spring frost, or if you have a lot of, uh, fog or heavy rains during pollination, but it, it really is a head scratcher, you know, sometimes in, if you have drought in the summer, but I don't think you've had those kinds of uh, weather characteristics, so I, you know, I, I just don't know. And uh, in, in terms of the squirrels, probably most gardeners would be saying, you know, woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, people are surprised to know that squirrels are omnivores, actually. Uh, you know, they will rely heavily on the seed. There's a lot of other, uh, trees and fruits they can eat too you know they'll eat maple buds and maple seeds but they'll eat insects they'll eat small birds they'll eat uh amphibians snakes uh small rodents you know when they're hungry they'll they'll do it it's not yeah. probably typical but they are omnivores so and they're adaptable if there's no food in that region they'll go somewhere else too so i won't worry too much about the squirrels but uh, i don't know if you, you guys have any thoughts about uh, no nuts on we had one Three previous species. that had a similar question yeah. about honey locust and, and, and we figured that it was because they'd had a lot of honey locust seeds the previous year and then none this last year. And uh, we have had some severe droughts and some, uh, and some uh, severe winters that uh, could have easily got them into a heavy, heavy production mm -hmm. after those times of stress. And now that it's lightened up a little bit, they're having to recover and rebuild and they don't have the energy yet to uh, do a do a, a nut crop which or a fruit crop, which may be what the deal is. Different with species are doing it at the <coughs> same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and then it'll happen heavy one year, late next year, and just stay that way until we you know, yeah. send that out. Evens out. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, very very intriguing question. All right, let's go next to you, Jim. Well, I have a turf disease that also has got my head scra being scratched because. Uh, the description of the d problem does not fit any n disease I know of on turf. He basically has black spots that turn into fuzz balls uh, and the grass dies. Um, there are some of the diseases that cause black lesions and black pustules, but none of them make fuzzy looking growth or fuzzy looking balls. So the one I came up with is probably closest to what you're describing is a slime mold. And there are many different kinds of slime mold that grow on grass. They're not uh, pathogens per se on the grass. They are saprophytic fungi that grow, uh, sporulate up on the blade so that they can uh, spread their spores away. And when they're fresh, they're, they can be white and gray and, and all that. But when the spores begin to break open, or the pustules that release the spores, they can go from white through gray to black and all other colors. And if they were getting a black uh, sporulation pattern, uh, that can look really f uh, kind of fuzzy, but it doesn't make a ball. So I'm going to suggest, again, that if this is happening in your lawn this coming spring, that you send a sample to the plant clinic or take it into your local extension office for identification. Okay, very interesting way they describe that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to go to the mag quiz next. In general, when is the best time to water the plants in your garden? A, early morning, B, noon, C, evening, D, every six hours. A, early morning. 
It's important that plants are watered early so that the moisture on the plants can dry during the day. This reduces the risk of disease. Okay, let's go to you, Phil, to finish us off. We have one, a caller who says that rabbits have been eating my coneflowers and fall sunflowers and snipped off any stems more than five to six inches tall. Will the plants recover by producing new stems if I'm able to protect them? Uh, we're talking about perennials here and they're gonna come up from the root system. And so they will come back. You can protect them with uh, poultry wire, poultry netting, two feet at least above the snow line. Or you can also spray with thyram, which is sold to some rabbit and deer repellents. Very good. I knew you could do it quickly <laughs> if you needed to. So just wait and see. That's probably, yeah, but do some, come back. some protecting. Well, good. We want to thank each of you folks for watching. We're really happy that you've joined us. And I thank the three of you for being here and for your expertise. So we hope to see you next week. Have a great week. Bye-bye. <laughs>